gentlemen. Thank you, Luis, for the kind invitation to be here in Madrid. Uh, these are new results uh, here for the double blind uh, sham controller trial called Brave Dreams, that means uh, brain drainage against uh, MS. Uh, in the first report, uh, uh, approximately two years ago, uh, the group uh, investigated uh, and gave results on the relapsing remitting uh, clinical course. There are two primary outcomes, disability and new MRI lesion, and uh, venous PTI, PTA had no effect on both uh, measure in the relapsing remitting population. We have an expanded analysis, which includes uh, also a patient with secondary progressive, because the primary outcome was just a new lesion at MRI. Uh, we inc included more than 200 people. Interestingly, the uh, prevalence of chronic cerebral spinal venous insufficiency in the neck and thoracic vein was 72%. And uh, this was confirmed by venography in 96% of cases. Uh, this is double blind data. High quality randomized trial because 96% of our patients concluded the follow up. And these are our results. So the likelihood to have uh, to be lesion free, it was more than 42% greater in patients who uh, underwent to PTA. The number of people under current uh, immunomodulatory or immunosuppressive drug in the two group were exactly the same. It was not significantly different. <laughs> Interestingly, this was uh, published in uh, last year, uh, new multiple sclerosis lesion are dependent from flow restoration. So the question was uh, in post-doc analysis, may we identify in advance the responders? Uh, we hypothesized that uh, uh, PTA outcome uh, was influenced by the morphology of uh, venous obstruction in the neck. This because uh, in 2016, uh, the Jaquinta group published uh, a large number of uh, cases, about 800 cases, showing uh, uh, that pre-op morphology affects the effectiveness of PTA in jugulars, especially they identified six uh, subtypes and three of these are unfavorable, unsuitable for the PTA treatment. So uh, the Brave Dreams trial venogram were reclassified by two internal lectures, uh, Galeotti and Jaquinta, and from two external lectures. There were uh, Setachi with the president of the European Society for Vascular Surgery and Professor Sclafani who is an interventional radiologist in, uh, in uh, Brooklyn, in New York. So we have a double lecture. If one of the rater uh, disagree about the diagnosis, the patient was excluded. So we had 82% uh, uh, of uh, uh, venogram in agreement, and there were classified 38 for favorable presentation to PTA treatment and 30 unfavorable presentation. These are the first unfavorable cases is compression where 19% of, uh, of the material. So you may understand this is a, a compression of a homoyoid muscle and uh, you may understand that PTA without stent cannot restore flow in this case. This is a second, uh, second unfavorable presentation, hypoplasia, 
in, in, in the, the, the neck is very difficult to identify the jugular vein because it's practically similar to the uh, collateral circle, 5% of cases. And the last unfavorable presentation with the presence of long vertical endoluminal defect that cannot be disrupted by the opening of the balloon. On the other side, favorable presentation are stenosis with or without endoluminal defect in this case. Very easy to be treated. Also horizontal endoluminal defects. 18% of the material. So in the top panel, you may see the uh, favorable cases and in the bottom panel, you may see a summary of uh, the situation where uh, the PTA does not work, definitely. Now, if you look again to our results, you may see that uh, PTA in favorable presentation are highly significantly better as compared to PTA in unfavorable presentation. And the same is by comparing favorable presentation with a sham group. But very interestingly, in my opinion, if you should compare PTA performed in unfavorable presentation versus sham, you may see that there is no difference. So if you should uh, uh, suggest in unfavorable presentation uh, to perform a procedure, you do not have any results. So this is, I think it's very important. If you should look to the MRI lesion at 0, 6, 6, 12 and 0, 12 months, you may see that at the beginning, in the first six months, uh, PTA uh, in favorable presentation showed less T1 gadolinium enhancing lesion. In my opinion, the reason is that the pressure is decreased in the, in the jugular vein you have a better glymphatic uh, drainage, and so the gadolinium is uh, drained, and you don't uh, see it in the MRI at six months. Freedom from new and or enlarged T2, uh, the top is after six months, between months six and 12. And freedom from new combined lesion, which was the primary outcome, was was highly significant different between months 0, 12 and 6, 12. So PTA works in favorable venous obstruction, like short segmental stenosis and horizontal endoluminal defects, whereas in compression, hypoplasia, and longitudinal defects do not. The above favorable subtypes represent the surgical indication to GTSVI treatment by means of safe balloon angioplasty and can be identified in advance by the means of ultrasound. Our study confirmed the efficacy of the Jaquinta grading system in selecting proper patients for the treatment. And finally, PTA could be proposed in selecting CCSVI MS patients because flow restoration is protective against MRI dissemination of new lesion. Uh, the article is available for free download uh, from the Medline and uh, it has been published on the Journal of Endovascular Therapy. Thank you for your attention. The second, uh, yes. Uh, both okay, okay. But uh, uh, if you have to to go out because I don't know this uh, this program. Okay, in a presentation. Okay.
this is a work in progress and Luis asked me to to tell about this uh, is the jugular venous pulse in aging and cognitive disorder. This is a new concept uh, because uh, uh, you may see in this beautiful paper uh, in the Journal of Hypertension, uh, with the hypothesis of the unexplored role of wave propagation in stiff arteries in low resistance territories. So the, the concept is neurodegeneration mediated by biomechanical injury a long time. Especially if you have a stiff carotid artery or a stiff renal artery, in patients with hypertension and diabetes, we are the two major risk for cognitive disorders. The possibility uh, of, uh, of injury at the, at the level of the microcirculation is increased. And uh, this is proven by this beautiful uh, work uh, uh, of a group that is in close connection with us, is group in the uh, University College of London, who followed up for about 20 years, more than 3,000 subjects, um, measuring uh, the uh, a parameter which is carotid wave intensity uh, is uh, a, a parameter that can be uh, measured in post-analysis by simple uh, echo color Doppler. And in practically is the ratio between the pressure of the subject against the wall of the artery. In the meantime, uh, all the patients were measured for cognitive assessment. A test battery administered in, were administered in four phases. And what uh, appears very clearly, the progressive decrease in global cognitive score, per set of 10, 12 years, the definitive diagnosis of dementia. So there is a a broad spectrum of time where we can uh, act uh, before uh, the, the diagnosis of dementia. The results of this study are really unbelievable because uh, risk of accelerated cognitive decline in the percentile with the worst uh, uh, carotid wave uh, uh, intensity was uh, practically 50% greater respect to the, to the other population. So this means that uh, uh, hemodynamics plays a role in, in cognitive disorders. It's an approach very different from molecular approach, but I think that is very important. Data and the study are unbeatable and debatable. There are also other detectable signals from the circulatory point of view in the so-called art brain axis. One of this is the jugular venous pulse. Uh, jugular venous pulse are a, a complex of five uh, wave and peaks, each cardiac beat that represents the change in pressure in the right atrium. Uh, there are, so A and uh, C and V are positive <laughs> wave, and uh, these are correlated to the central venous pressure, and the X and Y are negative trap. Uh, the jugular venous pulse uh, is considered uh, really uh, the major uh, measurement of heart uh, failure, and also uh, is considered a, a very significant uh, risk factor for dementia. Now we were capable to measure for the first time the jugular venous pulse, because usually is a, a physical examination for cardiologists, but uh, with ultrasound, Jugular venous pulse, it is exactly the change in cross-sectional area over the cardiac cycle. Uh, we 
uh, validated this method and also used this method uh, with, in conjunction with the NASA in a spatial mission in order to uh, measure the brain circulation of the astronauts. You may see uh, the change in cross-sectional area uh, over the cardiac beat. And in post-processing, we are capable to collect about uh, 40 uh, different cross-sectional area along a cardiac beat and to reconstruct the, the, the wave and the peak of the jugular venous pulse. Also, uh, this, uh, and this paper is in cross, is in, in paper, the uh, cross uh, correlation between the jugular venous pulse and the uh, central venous pressure or jugular pressure measured by catheter are closely correlated. So this method may help us to measure the pressure non-invasively. This is a pilot study, two aims, to assess the internal jugular vein cross-sectional area variation in different groups of age by the means of the ultrasonic uh, jugular venous pulse and to compare the healthy subject with the cross-sectional area variation versus people with uh, mid middle cognitive disorders, mild cognitive disorders. This is the patient population with subgroup uh, in the different ECADs. And you may see that the jaguar venous pulse are really different along the decades. And practically, there is a tendency, uh, a significant uh, uh, tendency to increase the cross-sectional area along the, uh, along the life. Particularly uh, in, uh, in the elderly, uh, the peak A and the peak V, so the two positive peak, are really significantly different respect to the over to the other age of the life. Aims two was to compare healthy subjects variation with mild cognitive impairment. The population was blinded assessed of two different groups of subject, 62 healthy control, and 20 patients with mild cognitive impairment supported by PET amyloid scan. The results show really, again, a significant differences between healthy people and, and people with mild cognitive impairment regarding the propagation of venous uh, wave upward to the brain. These are the two curves. Mild cognitive impairment is the blue, so the, the cross-sectional area is increased with respect to the red of healthy controls. But also, we match it for age, uh, the, the population of mild cognitive impairment. And the difference was, again, really strong. So you may see that if you should look to the, to, to the blue line of the mild cognitive impairment, this is really highly significantly different respect to all the other healthy population in the different age of the life. Conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, this is a pilot study needing further investigation, but ultrasonic jugular venous pole variation are different among age decades. Ultrasonic jugular venous pulse trace it is significantly wider in mild cognitive impairment compared to healthy control matched for age. Jugular venous pulse seems to be not only age related, but also cognitive related. And finally, the significance of our findings is complex and needs further investigation, maybe also of discussion this evening. Thank you very much.
How did you relate it to the, the cardiac function of the older individuals? So, so in terms of the, the, the widening, because you can see that as the patient gets a bit older, right? So I mean, if, if there's associated cardiac dysfunction, I guess that is. Yes, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, certainly uh, connected with the cardiac function. And maybe you may have people with uh, underestimated a chronic heart failure that uh, does not give classic uh, uh, clinical signs and are maybe not controlled. But you may imagine patients with, on one side, arterial stiffness, and on the other, a problem. So we have two waves that uh, runs upward, and I think that this is very dangerous. But uh, since we, we may have, according to the data, 10, 12 years, we may maybe do something in the meantime. For example, uh, is, 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 if you have stiff carotid artery, you may put a more elastic scaffold inside. Why not, for example? So this kind of data really open new unbelievable perspectives. Thank you, Paolo. It's a fantastic uh, way. And uh, the question is, when you are the dementia secondary to low pressure hydrocephalia, you are checked see if the same patient have an abnormalities or in the venous drainage. Yes, we, we found uh, a very strange situation which was uh, in part similar to intracranial hypertension that we followed uh, today, but with enlargement of the ventricles, not with small ventricles. So there was intracranial hypertension and dilated ventricles. And this happened not when the sinus are occluded, but when the jugular are occluded, because maybe play a role uh, the collateral circulation in the neck. So the, the time is longer of clinical uh, manifestation of symptoms, but we really we have uh, the uh, hydrocephalus and the intracranial hypertension. And uh, we uh, call it this syndrome, this is published in the Ignacta Neurochirurgica, uh, GDI syndrome, this means jugular entrapment because usually are bilateral muscular compression, similar to what I show you for the uh, uh, multiple sclerosis, chronic cerebral spinal venous insufficiency, that was monolateral. But it, in this case, it's really bilateral and uh, uh, intracranial hypertension and dilated ventricles. I think that maybe if uh, uh, the point of view is only is not only in the skull, but you, if you should, for example, also by Anjo CT, uh, ask for uh, a prolonged time for the venous time and look also at, at the neck. This is my proposal. Thank you. So in light of the uh, new findings uh, about uh, the um, anatomy of a, st of a stenosis, the mechanism of a stenosis, do you plan to resume a new, uh, a new prospective clinical trial um, using, because the data that you have are postdoc data, so uh, they will not be recognized by, no. you know, by, so taking this into account, and selecting patients according, you know, to the the exploratory data that you that you just told us about. Yes, but this this time we would like to use uh, a, a devoted venous stent for extracranial veins. So in this way, only uh, people with hypoplasia uh, can be can can excluded. 
so we may have a more range of people, treatable people. Uh, at this moment, we have uh, the permission of our Ministry of Health and, uh, uh, and of Ethical Committee for a trial for just a day. A day and treatable a day with this new stent uh, is very similar to the river, but is more proper for extracranial use because there is very few metal, there is no excessive uh, radial pressure, that is longitudinal pressure. And also in this case, we have the distal, or the close to the heart, the greater uh, uh, cross-sectional area respect to the, the proximal part. So many of the concept, uh, but the difference because the, the use is uh, extracranial is this kind of stent is collapsible because you know that the jugular vein, when you are uh, uh, in standing or in upright are very, very little in diameter. To the contrary, when the, the subject is uh, supine are enlarged. So this kind of stent is capable to follow the change in cross-sectional area. This does not happen intracranial because you do not have more the atmospheric pressure. So the, uh, the vein at the level of, uh, uh, of the skull uh, does not have this kind of compliance. And so your, your stent is perfect. Um, how much does the venous pulse change with uh, position? You know, have you tested in patients uh, when laying flat with the sleep apnea? Because that might be also a co-founder. This is a very good question. Uh, in rate, there is no difference because you have a smaller cross-sectional area in upright, and the variation of the wave. Is very, is very similar to that uh, in rate. The percentage of variation is the same. And the same happened without gravity when you use uh, this method for monitoring the astronaut uh, in the International Space Station. So this is very interesting. So the major uh, regulator is the art, as currently said before. And this because the uh, the signal is at about one hertz, the measure of the signal. And one hertz is the signal of the heart. So this means that uh, uh, the major regulator is really the heart. But if you should have a compression or a standard compression of an intraluminal defect as in CCSVI, this uh, is not true because uh, the transmission of the wave from the heart is really hampered and uh, changed completely, either in supine position or in, in, uh, in upright. Uh, congr congratulations. Uh, I've worked with uh, José Aboulquer a long time ago. Great. This is the history. This is the history. Uh, I was convinced that he, he was right. Okay, so, but it, it is difficult. You want to open the veins, okay, to yeah. keep the uh, to keep the veins opened. Intuitively, personally, I don't have experience of stenting in the veins. I have a lot of experience in arteries, but in in arteries, I'm sure it's not good to to you. It's good to use good. Uh, uh, strength, you know, and I'm sure with the vein it is the same. It's not interesting to have something which is going this way because you will get a resinosis for, for sure. You want to open it, okay, okay. whatever the position. So why don't you put a, a radial force which stays open? This is what I think. 
because of the level of pressure is really different. For example, in the jugular vein in upright, the pressure is negative mm -hmm. because these veins are above the heart. So you have a pressure in, in, in the neck of minus 30. Mm -hmm. So you do not need to have what is the risk of getting the because you open? you increase the possibility of uh, uh, smooth muscle cell proliferation and uh, and of restenosis due to the the damage of endothelial layer. Uh, this kind of stent uh, is uh, uh, just one point of contact. nothing more and uh, we performed uh, different animal studies on pigs in the protein model uh, we do not have any migration or complication nothing so i think that uh, so the philosophy of the vein is really different from yes, that of the artery I, I agree, I, agree. But I, I agree but i would be very much interested in trying it open it with something good or ill for us. Oh, but this is what was done. But there was a three, four percent of, of thrombosis or maybe more. Yes, yes. And another population that might be interesting to study is uh, people that have dialysis renal failure because they have cognitive uh, issues. I don't know if it's because the electrolytes or, and you know, when they put the fistula, you know, usually the venous system increase the pressure because that's the, the purpose of the fistula. I, I completely agree. And uh, the day before to, to leave to Madrid, I had uh, a, a meeting with uh, our nephrologists are very interested in uh, have stiffness of the artery and jugular venous pulse in their population. So I think that this project will be done uh, uh, along this year and uh, it will be very interesting to understand what happens. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Here you have the, the best presentation. Okay, I profile with uh, Professor Zamboni with me and Teron. Thank you very much. I, I like you stay in Madrid uh, these two days. Uh, expect the next year you are the new opportunity to present your things, your paper, wherever you want. Uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you all the people of organized the, the meeting kindness group and thank you the support company. And thank you very much, my family and my friends. Good afternoon. Thank you, thank you. Guys.